Everybody thinks their life story would make a good book. I'm here to tell you that's not true. But Larry Harris is not everybody. He's 1970s records mogul Neil Bogart's cousin and a co-founder of legendary Casablanca Records, for heaven's sakes. And boy, does he have a great story to tell. Reading his new book, And Party Every Day, The Inside Story of Casablanca Records, is to be transported back to the wild early days of the rock band Kiss and the origins of disco with Donna Summer and Giorgio Moroder. There are insider stories, anecdotes, and revelations about how the music business and the radio industry work that will curl your hair, if you have any left from that era. Uh, me, not, not so much. Uh, it seems like every page has something fresh, fascinating, and sensational, from the mountains of cocaine and payola to who slept with whom. And there are even some mafia implications as well. Read this book and then decide whether your life holds up. Larry, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob. How are you? I'm good. I don't have any hair either. <laughs> See? <laughs> Seven well, maybe took it all the way. <laughs> maybe our toes will curl or something. I don't know. Larry, i got to ask you, I mean, is, is anyone in your life still speaking to you after publication of this book? This is pretty sensational a lot of people, stuff. A lot of people have called and said they love it. They think it's great. Um, Neil Bogart's son called. He loved it. He thought his father would have loved it. Uh, so, yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Because, I mean, as a reader, it's a great read. I mean, it's just, I, I was just, I was amazed starting it. Uh, and every time I flip the page, there's something new. And it's like, wow, you know, there are some guys who will write a book about their life, and they'll have, you know, four or five interesting stories and, you know, fascinating things, and they have to spread it out over 300 pages. But uh, that's not the case here. No, it was an amazing period. It really was. And, and it was, nobody realized it, or I certainly didn't at the time, uh, how amazing a story it would become. Hmm. Why did it uh, – Neil's been gone for, what, like 20 years now. Uh, why did it take uh, so long more, to tell the story? 1982, so, yeah. Okay, 27 years. Why did it take so long to get the story told? Well, you know, uh, at first it wasn't a story. Uh, it was just something that happened. Um, yeah, about 10, 12 years ago, I sat down one day after people kept bugging me about, oh, all these stories, you should write a book. And So one day I had nothing to do, and I started putting down some ideas and thoughts and uh, to really stream of consciousness stuff. And uh, then I put it away, and I took it out, and I put it away, and then I didn't look at it for years, and then I took it out. And eventually I said, well, I'll give it a shot and sent it to some publishers, and they all said no. And really? I was about to self-publish it uh, because I, it, in my life now I get people who write books or musicians, and I get them on syndicated radio shows and stuff like that. And yeah. I know how hard it is if you self-publish. Um, most people don't pay attention to you, especially the <laughs> critics and everybody. So anyway, uh, eventually... Um, um, ran across two guys who were working on a book with Lydia Chris, who's uh, uh, Peter Chris's wife. He's the ex-drummer of Kiss. Right. And uh, they asked me to, you know, look at a picture and tell them who was in it. And then we started chatting. And they happen to be two Kiss freaks. Uh, not <laughs> that the book is is the book has Kiss in it, but it's not by any stretch of the imagination, you know, mostly Kiss. And um, we decided to work on it a little together, um, and they fixed it up a little bit. They did some more interviews with people. They researched, you know, exact dates and stuff, because I don't remember if it was March or June or, you know, when these things happened. And right. um, then we, again, got turned down by, like, 30 publishers. And then Hal Leonard, uh, which is a music publisher, basically, of books and uh, sheet music, loved the story, and that's how the book came out. Wow. Well, I, I got to tell you that um, your uh, your co-authors, uh, Kurt Gooch and uh, Jeff Sues, did a, they did a great job by you. I, I mean, I make my living doing what they did here, working with people who have you know, stories to tell. And it just uh, – every page is just dripping with stuff I want to read. You know, I, I find that uh, remarkable, frankly. Yeah, no, they helped a lot. Uh, it, 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 it's basically the same story I wrote 12 years ago. There's been you know things left out and things put in just because of the length we were limited to in the book. We actually went over the length we were supposed to do. 
Uh, there would have been a lot more stories, but the publisher didn't want to print a 500-page book. So, <laughs> um, well, let's uh, <clears throat> let's go back uh, to before Casablanca, and which is kind of where the story starts. Uh, uh, Neil Bogart turns out to be your cousin. You didn't know it at the time. You're introduced, and then you don't really have any contact with him. Uh, tell tell folks about how he brought you into the, the music business. Well, um, Neil was my cousin on my father's side of the family, and we weren't real close to that side of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I met him, uh, I think I was like 13 or 14. And he was probably 18 or 19 or something like that. And uh, he brought me a record uh, that he had done called Bobby by an artist named Neil Scott, which was the name he was using. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, made top 40 on the charts or something like that. And it was one of those girl dies in a car crash accident thing. And um, uh, then I hadn't seen him again for, uh, my parents went to a wedding uh, in 1970. Uh, and uh, they saw his mom and they were talking and his mom said, oh, if your son's looking for a job, have him call my son. And so I called Neil and he was at Buddha Records. He was the president of Buddha Records, I think. At that point, he was the youngest president ever in the music business of a major label. And although Buddha wasn't as major as Columbia or Capital or RCA or Warner Brothers, but it was it was a su substantial label. Um, and I went up to see him, and it was uh, very interesting because I sat around these. I talk about the offices; they were disgusting purple and <laughs> really, really gross-looking offices. But I went up there and I sat around for four or five hours and. Uh, they kept asking me who I was and what I was doing there, and I said, well, he said I should come in and meet with him, and wound up, I found out later that he had to call his mom again uh, on the phone to find out who I was. But lucky for me, the guy who was doing local promotion for New York for Buddha was caught um, on the couch in the office as Neil was coming back from dinner with the company, a very straight-laced education company called Vulex. The president of that company and Neil had gone out to dinner. Um, and come back and found this guy on the couch in the office with a music director of a major New York radio station um, making love. And uh, the guy was so incensed from Vulex that he had Neil fire the guy on the spot. If Neil had just walked in by himself, he would have given the guy a raise for doing that. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, a week later, I walked in and the job was open, so I got the, I got the job. Now I got to ask you about that story because you were it's a little vague in the book and a little vague in the telling here and not to be too salacious but did he find him with another man or a woman? No, no, a woman. Oh, okay, because you know it was the, a female a female music director. Okay, cuz the industry and and still to this day is starred largely uh, men in those positions. The so is I, definitely yes, the industry is definitely uh, more male oriented than female oriented, uh, even to this day. But uh, there are some females who have made it, uh, yeah, made it to pretty high levels, but not 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 as many as should have. Okay. Well, I was just curious. It doesn't really matter. I was just kind of curious. I thought it was a little. That one part seemed a little vague, and I thought, hmm, man or woman? I'm just curious. <laughs> so, so, so in those in those days, uh, a lot of the women who were music directors were there to be a buffer for the program director more than actually choose the music. Right, right. And and uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. But, uh, so uh, you you come in, you, you join him at Buddha, and then an opportunity arises to uh, leave Buddha, start a new label, Casablanca, and you guys, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm trying to remember, at, you've got well, the kids. Buddha, the, Buddha story, the Buddha story itself is a fascinating story. Uh, and I talk about Buddha in the book. Not, not a whole yeah. lot, not as much as, as Casablanca, but... The Buddha story was uh, a story about uh, uh, artists like Brewer and Shipley and Gladys Knight and Bill Withers and Curtis Mayfield, and there's a lot of drugs and stuff involved with with that with Curtis. Um, and uh, we we started in the comedy business. We had David Fry and Robert Klein, uh, Michael Franks, who I usually leave out of my stories for no other reason than. Uh, at that point in his career, there was nothing exciting happening. Uh -huh. uh, it, it didn't. It didn't really break for him until he went over to Warner Brothers. Uh, um, I'm a big Michael Franks fan, so I appreciate you mentioning him. Oh, well, he's a really nice guy, but 
the first album we had with him was on Brut, uh, the perfume, Brut Fabergé, the perfume company, decided to dabble in the music business. And their only two artists were Michael Franks and Robert Klein, uh, which was kind of cool, though. I learned a lot about that business from those people, you know, to learn that, you know, uh, perfume sells for $50, $100 a bottle, but it cost them a nickel to make. <laughs> um, so they had private jets. The first time I was ever in a private jet, was a, it was a Brut Fabergé private jet that Robert Klein and I had to go on some some tour with. Uh, but it was pretty cool. It was actually the only time I was on a private jet. Uh, but the Buddha, the Buddha experience it was wonderful. We brought Genesis to America. I talk about how we brought Monty Python to America and how we exposed it to PBS, and that's when the whole Monty Python thing slammed over American waters. So, um, uh, but it was an amazing thing, and the things we learned, or I learned there, I uh, used at Casablanca to help break Kiss. Kiss um, it was not it was not easy at the beginning. It was not like a slam dunk. They oh it was, I guess it, <laughs> yeah it was anything were, but a slam dunk. They were the, the the makeup turned everybody off. Yeah, it wasn't so much the music, which was not wonderful, but it was certainly the makeup that made people uh, cringe and go, well, "We're not going to play this. Are you crazy?" <laughs> So we had to find ways around that, and um, but we did know we had a band who could perform incredibly well and blow the audience away every time. Uh, we had a similar band like that at Buddha. We had Shanana. Every time Shanana performed, aside from the women coming in poodle skirts and stuff too, and they're probably <laughs> their mother's poodle skirts, um, Shanana never failed to make the audience stand up and dance and go crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a great show, um, and we knew Kiss had that same kind of show, but how do you translate that into music, record sales, uh, and airplay? And um, what we eventually did, which I, I don't know that anybody has done since, is spend a fortune guaranteeing and paying for Kiss's shows because nobody would let them open a show for them after the first couple of months uh, because they were almost impossible to follow. Right. So um, we wound up, getting them gigs in markets that they didn't even have airplay and uh, we covered any shortfall that the promoters in the markets would 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 have and uh, it worked because once they came into a market and performed word spread drastically well you you give the example i think in new york of a date you did with uh, ron delsner uh was it the beacon theater uh yeah um we they I, came I in and they sold that. out well, we did have a little airplay in New York. Mm. Um, we had uh, N.E.W. and P.L.J. playing the album a little bit, uh, and they were two big A.O.R. rock stations, um, but no, to no no huge degree. And I called Ron Delsner, who was the big promoter in New York, and we had relationships with him again from the old Buddha days. Mm -hmm. And Delsner thought I was crazy, but I said, "Look, Ron, put on one show. It's only like a three thousand seat theater." Mm -hmm. um, if you lose any money, we'll we'll pay you for it. And uh, you know he he believed we'd pay him, which we would have. And he put on the show. I got a call a few days. I was just hanging out in Neil's office because at that point we didn't have a lot of artists on the label. And I'm hanging out, and I get a call from Delsner, and he said the show sold out. I said put another one on. And he <laughs> he thought I was out of my mind, and Neil thought I was out of my mind. And but Neil, one thing about Neil. He'd let you. He'd give you enough rope to really hang yourself. He hoped you wouldn't, but <laughs> you know he'd give it to you. And uh, the next show sold out in a couple hours. Uh, so you know, Kiss exploded there. But the big story for Kiss was Detroit, where I walked into WABX, which was the big rock station in those days in Detroit, and uh, the program director was on the air, Mark Parento, um, who was wound up being a big disc jockey in Boston and New York later on, and um, Mark. And I started doing coke on the Kiss album jacket, which was mostly black with their faces. So it was a great album to do coke on. And uh, while he's on the air, he's telling me, no, I don't like this band. I like this new band, Aerosmith. Uh, I'm going to play them more. And I said, well, you know, if there's nothing else I can do, here's the deal. We'll put on a show. We'll pay for everything. You pick any acts you want. If Kiss blows the audience away within the first two minutes that they're on stage then you got to play them like they're the second coming. If they don't, I'll never talk to you. I'll never mention their name to you again. 
Well, Mark went for it. The show wound up. It was a free show. Well, no, I think it was like 97 cents that went to charity or something. Mm-hmm. And it was a show that included Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, Kiss, and Aerosmith. And it was the first time Aerosmith oh. and Kiss had ever played in Detroit. And um, Mark and I went to, uh, we were in the middle of the floor, of the right in the orchestra kind of area, in the middle of the crowd, and when Kiss went on, you could hear a pin drop because everybody was like their mouths were open. It was what the hell is this? <laughs> and after Gene spit his first fire, it was all over. The place went crazy. Mark turned to me and said, "You win." And uh, that has always been their biggest market. Well, and I got to ask you something about Gene. And and I, I've interviewed Gene um, as, a, as a as a music critic fifteen twenty years ago, and that that interview is actually on, online if anyone wants to hear it. But my condolences. It's, it's kind of. I'm sorry? My condolences. <laughs> well, you had I want to ask you, it's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very strange thing, isn't it, that um, you, were, you were promoting them with, a, with, with people in, in the radio industry, with Coke and that kind of thing. Gene and Paul, apparently, very straight all these years, not interested in that stuff themselves. Oh, very straight. No, I've never saw Gene or Paul. Uh, I may have seen them once have a glass of wine, but that's probably the most I've ever, if I've if it was even wine in the glass. Mm. Yeah, they were very straight, where Peter and Ace, the other two members of the band, were, were far from very straight. Right. Well, um, boy, time, time is just ticking by. I want to ask you about the other really big act on Casablanca, which was Donna Summer. Um, she was almost a by, just a, an afterthought when, when you guys signed Giorgio Moroder, right? Well, she, we didn't sign Georgia Morota. What happened was a woman named Trudy Mizell came to our office. We had just left Warner Brothers. We had no money. Mm-hmm. Um, we had hardly any acts. We had Kiss and Parliament, basically, uh, and the, uh, the Hudson Brothers, but really very few acts, and we needed product flow because we were going into independent distribution. And um, this woman came into the office with three pieces of product, two electronic rock groups, Einzel Geiger and Schloss and Donna Summer. Mm -hmm. And we liked all three, but we had no money. But Neil came up with the idea that he'll give Giorgio a label in the U.S. Uh, He already had a label in in Europe, uh, and it was called Oasis. So everybody thought, how synergistic, Casablanca, Oasis, (laughs) the desert, you know. So um, Giorgio agreed. uh, So we got the product for nothing. We marketed it and distributed it and manufactured it. But we didn't have to pay for the product. And that's how we got Donna Summer. Um, her first uh, record, Love to Love You Baby, did not happen the first time it came out. It was only after a, a drunken, drug-induced party at Neil's house that somebody bumped into the record player. While, it couldn't happen today, of course. Uh, yeah. While Love to Love You Baby was playing, the needle bump jumped back to the beginning, as it would on a record player. And the song became longer, and everybody in their stupors realized, oh, this is much groovier. So Neil <laughs> called Giorgio in Germany that night. I don't know, it must have been three in the morning. Giorgio thought he was crazy, because they had never met up to this point. And um, explained, and Giorgio had a heavy German accent, so it wasn't easy to explain that Neil wanted a longer version of the song. And Giorgio came up with a longer version, which wound up being the hit. Well, and Donna, I mean, I, I was listening, and I'm going to play when, as we end in a few minutes uh, a bit from uh, I Feel Love, Donna Summer, another one of her hits. I, I think for a lot of people in that era, I mean, Donna Summer was just was sex personified. But years later, it seemed like she kind of, uh, you know, tried to disown a lot of that. Um, she was what never, can you tell us about she was ne- Even in those days, she wasn't comfortable with uh, that whole sex thing. Um, when she did Love to Love You Baby, it was supposed to be a demo that Georgia was doing. It wasn't supposed to be her album. And she it, it was something she was never comfortable with. Um, to this day, I think she would like to, although it did start her career and everything, um, like to disavow that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, she never thought of herself as a sex queen or a disco queen. or She was just a, a singer who, you know, Later on, went to make a whole bunch of different kind of music. Uh, mm-hmm. I think she's even done a country album. So, uh, but you all know, too bad we don't have time because you still have the Village People and the Parliament that I was know. huge. And, uh, there were some, you know, other other share share was on the label. Uh, Robin Williams, Rodney Dangerfield. There's some other really great stories in the book about those people. Well, like I said, every it seems like every page had. <clears throat> 
something incredible to talk about. Um, I, I, look, let me take this one extra opportunity to just tell people, if you have any interest in that era, uh, either the culture of the time, the music of the time, the 70s, we're talking about the 70s, or just you know, uh, the radio industry even, you've got to read this book. I, I don't usually go overboard um, uh, endorsing something like this, but it's just a great read. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that you're just not going to find somewhere else. So, um, you know, Larry, uh, I appreciate that and enjoyed the book very much. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. And uh, so, I mean, thank you for joining us today. And you've got a website, right? The Casablanca Books. Casablanca dot com is a bunch of uh, rare, rare old videos. Casablanca was way ahead of everybody else making videos in the seventies. No, nobody was really doing it like we were. And there must be fifty or so videos of the uh, Donna Summer and Kiss and Cher and Parliament and everybody um, on the site. If people want to look at those. And uh, before you go, what are you doing today? I uh, have a company. Uh, we do some syndication of radio shows. We also get people exposure on nationally syndicated talk and music shows for whether it be musicians or products or services. Uh, we use radio as much as we can to help uh, get exposure for people's products. Got it. All right. Well, uh, folks, again, the book is um, And Party Every Day, The Inside Story of Casablanca Records by Larry Harris. Uh, you, can, you can find out more about the book at casablancabook.com. You can order it on mrmedia.com. And, uh, Larry, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. And, folks, for more music-related interviews, you can surf over to our main website. It's www.mrmedia.com. MrMedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations, one I mentioned uh, with Gene Simmons of KISS. Uh, there's one with the late John Denver, as well as music journalists such as Legs McNeil, David Wilde, Bart Bull, and many others. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. And don't forget to tell your friends the show you like so much, Mr. Media. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman or facebook.com slash andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and join us. Thanks for listening.